Every American kid knows at least two things. First, US is the best country in the world. And second, US won the three great conflicts of the 20th century. World War II, Cold War and the Space Race. Let's talk about the most interesting one, the Space Race. It's interesting because it was the most harmless form of conflict, a technology competition, not an arms race. Two powerful states spending billions of dollars with the sole purpose of conquering space for the benefit of mankind. And then the US wins the competition brilliantly by sending a man to the moon. At least that's how Americans see it. But what about other points of view? First, let's talk about harmless competition and benefit of the mankind. You actually think that they have spent billions on space so that the humanity could one day fly away to conquer Jupiter holding hands in peace and harmony? If you think so, then you are probably very naive. In fact, space exploration served just as another arena for the Cold War. Each superpower sought to prove the supremacy of its technology, its military firepower and basically its whole political system. The conquest of space was only a byproduct. At the start of this race, countries competed to see who would be the first one to create an intercontinental ballistic missile that could directly strike an opponent anywhere on Earth. And the key role in the beginning of this race was played not by the Soviet Union and not by the United States, but by Germany, or rather German scientists. German scientists were a key force in both major arms races during the Cold War. Everyone knows how and why the Manhattan Project was started and how many German emigrants worked on it. The USSR did not lag behind. After 1945, about 600 German scientists who could be useful in nuclear research were transferred to the Soviet Union. But back to the space race. After their defeat in the First World War, Germany was forbidden to have long-range artillery, so the Reich's where command showed an interest in rocket weapons, and in 1942 they created the V-2 rocket, which can be considered a progenitor to all other space rockets. Faltzwey itself was unable to overcome the forces of gravity, but it was by far the most high-tech rocket of the time. It is known that immediately after the surrender of Germany, the United States carried out several secret operations, the purpose of which was to prevent the technology transfer from German scientists to the Soviet Union. The main interest of the United States was of course the potential atomic bomb data, but as part of Operation Paperclip, a key group of German missile specialists was also taken to the United States, including the creator of the rocket Werner von Braun himself and the completed Fautzweiss samples, along with all technical documentation and drawings. Everything that could not be taken out was promptly destroyed. Fun fact, formally it was V2 that became the first object which traveled into space. It did not reach Earth orbit, but in a half-destroyed state it was able to rise to an altitude of 188 kilometers. It would seem that after 1945 there should not have been any kind of space race. The United States had V2 samples and the creator of the rocket himself while the USSR had nothing but some theoretical works of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky from the late 19th century. In 1945, no one could have thought that the USSR would become the first country to launch an artificial Earth satellite into space in just 12 years. It was truly unbelievable that someone would be able to challenge the supremacy of the American technology. Another unpleasant fact for the US, if the R-7 rocket can't deliver a huge piece of iron to Earth's orbit, then it will definitely be able to deliver a Soviet nuclear bomb straight to New York and Washington. By the way, this was the main purpose of the legendary R-7 rockets. They were developed exclusively as intercontinental missiles. Only the persistence of Sergei Korolev made it possible to convince USSR's top officials to allow him to use one of the valuable missiles in his risky space experiments. After the launch of the satellite, the United States urgently increased the funds for its own space program. Their goal was not to let the Soviets get too far ahead. However, we must admit that the United States will spend the next decade playing catch-up. 
It will take Americans 4 additional months to launch their first satellite, and all other major milestones of the space race will be achieved by USSR. First animal in space, first launch beyond Earth's orbit, first probe to reach the moon, first spacecraft to be sent to Venus, and of course, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. And then there would also be the first woman in space, the first man in space to do a spacewalk, the first group flight of spaceships, the first non-single space flight, the first soft landing on the moon, the first flight of animals around the moon. It's funny, but another delusion of many Americans is that the space race was always a race to the moon, right from the start. It's simply not true. It was a race for superiority over their opponent, a race to show their power without any specific goal other than a total defeat of their position. It was only after the United States lost all previous parts of the race to its rivals that President Kennedy made a speech where he said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose my ass. Everything else was already lost and it was necessary to bypass the USSR at least in something. At the same time, some plans to use the moon were developed in the United States back in the 50s. However, these plans were far from peaceful. For example, Project Horizon was aimed to create a military base on the moon, which would house nuclear warheads aimed at the Soviet Union. And the A119 project was even simpler. The United States just wanted to drop an atomic bomb on the moon to show everyone else that they can do it. Ingenious plan. Although I must be unbiased here, the Soviet Union had a similar project. And they abandoned it largely because the flash of the explosion would be too weak for everyone on Earth to see it. Those were great times. But most likely you already know everything about the American Apollo program. So let's talk about the Soviet one. For the first 10 years of the space race, the USSR was the leader in all aspects. Why couldn't they send a man to the moon? Of course, the main reason is that the set of the moon landing was in Hollywood, and Hollywood, as you know, is located in the USA, not in the USSR. Just kidding. In fact, there were two main reasons. The first reason is financial. The USSR was undoubtedly the main enemy of the United States on the world stage. But this is only from an ideological, military and technological points of view. From an economic point of view, the USSR never had the resources that the United States had. Enormous amounts of money were spent on space programs by USSR, and it was still not enough. According to many estimates, funding for the Soviet lunar program was about five times lower than funding for the American one. In addition, Brezhnev came to power in the USSR in 1964, and he was far more interested in kissing other men than in exploring the outer space. As a result, the USSR was forced to choose not always the best space project, but sometimes the cheapest ones. And so, the N1 launch vehicle was chosen as the rocket that was supposed to send the Soviet spacecraft to the moon. And this rocket ultimately became the main reason for the defeat of the USSR in the moon race. This rocket was developed by Korolev, the main person in the history of Soviet cosmonautics. Korolev's key mistake was that back in 1960 he believed that the available R-7 missiles would be suitable for a manned flight around the moon. The future proved him wrong. During the lunar test, the Americans had to lift up to 118 tons of cargo into orbit, while the R-7 was able to lift only 8, 15 times less. And Korolev was a strong opposer to any alternative projects. In particular, he was against the project of the UR-500 missile, which was proposed by Vladimir Chalamey, the leader of OKB-52, the main rival of Korolev's OKB-1. As a result, Korolev spent the first five years of the Soviet lunar program trying to prevent other people from participating in it. Instead, he had a rather strange idea of a space train of five separate paths that should be lifted by his favorite R-7 rockets and then connected with each other directly in space. Only in 1965 he finally realized that this idea is not going to work. He reached a compromise with Chalamet and concentrated fully on the development of the N-1 rocket, but a lot of time had already been lost. The UR-500K rocket, a joint project of Korolev and Chalamet, was launched to the moon 12 times, and only two flights went perfectly. There were lots of complications, but only twice the rocket itself was the problem. 
As a result, unmanned tests took so long that there was no point in sending this rocket with a manned spacecraft to the moon. Alternative, purely Korolev's design, performed far, far worse. All four launches of the N1 rocket ended in accidents, and the explosion during the second rocket launch practically destroyed the entire launch complex. Let's also remember the chain of tragic deaths that swept off the Soviet space industry. In 1966, Korolev, the father of all Soviet cosmonautics, died. In 1967, Vladimir Komarov, the most likely candidate for the position of a pilot of a lunar spaceship, died during landing of Soyuz 1. And in 1968, Yuri Gagarin, the legend himself and Komarov's backup for Soyuz 1 launch, died during a regular air flight. Another interesting fact is that Gagarin was removed from space flights precisely after Komarov's death, so as not to risk such a valuable figure. He died just after five weeks of returning to normal flights on regular training jets. The last chance of the USSR was the UR-700 rocket and the LK-700 lunar ship, both proposed by the same Chilami. This missile was planned to be made on the basis of the UR-500K, which showed good stability. 10 kinda successful launches out of 12 is much better than 0 out of 4 for the N1. The LK-700 ship was supposed to be truly unique. It was a lunar ship without a landing module. The ship was supposed to land on the moon wholly and then leave the landing platform on it and head back to Earth. By 1968 this project was completely ready. Even a full-size model of the ship was available, but it never received the permission for testing. And finally, I should mention one more person who was directly responsible for the failure of Soviet lunar program. Valentin Petrovich Glushko. A man who fiercely hated the N1 rocket proposed by Korolev. Its engine was supposed to work on hydrogen, and Glushko didn't like it very much. Glushko was the head of the best experimental design bureau in the country, and it was he who should have developed the engines for this rocket. Glushko simply refused to do this, and as a result the engines for the most important missile of the USSR were made by the Kuznetsov Design Bureau, which did not have a sufficient number of highly qualified specialists and simply lacked experience. As a result, the N1 rocket project failed, just as Glushko wanted. Eight years after the death of Korolev, in 1974, Glushko became the chief designer of the OKB No. 1, which created the N1. Literally, his first decree was the full closure of the entire lunar program. Six months later, he presented his own new program for the exploration of the moon to the government. To reach the moon, he proposed using the new Vulcan rocket, a rocket of his own design. And guess what? This new rocket was a carbon copy of the N1 rocket against which Glushko had fought for many, many years. In short, I think we can state that the USA did not win the moon race, but the USSR kinda lost it, and the human factor here became the main element. The United States lost the start of the space race, because Eisenhower was not interested in space, unlike Kennedy. In USSR, the opposite situation unfolded with Khrushchev and Brezhnev. After Khrushchev was removed from power, the interest of CPSU in the topic of outer space had dropped significantly, and along with it, the funding of space projects was heavily cut. As a result, the main people of the Soviet space program were left to their own devices, and they went about their favorite business, bickering among themselves. Korolev considered manned space flights the only important goal, and he was a rather difficult person overall. His successor mission was described by many as a sycophant who tried only to please the government. He aimed to conduct space flights quickly and cheaply, choosing to ignore some serious flaws of Soviet spaceships. These flaws eventually became the cause of the death of four cosmonauts during his tenure as general designer. Bobakin insisted on the exploration of space by automatic spaceships and did not think that manned flights were necessary at all. Chalamet was able to deftly maneuver himself between the two camps of Korolev and Babakin, but fell out of favor after Khrushchev left and was unable to get funding for his own projects. And finally, there was Glushko with his absurd resentment against Korolev, who did everything in his power to ensure that Soviet manned spaceships would never land on the moon.